Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious food to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. You are listening to Phantasm Podcast. Hey, this is Trevor Sternad. Hi, this is Back from the Black Dahlia Murder. I'm Gabriel Warrior. Eric Green from Simple Tour. We're all stolen from immolation. This is Anthony Michael. We are Gorgasm. This is Metaphone Crater. This is Ernie C. of Black Count. Turns from suffocation. Phantasm Podcast. Join your host, Corey Gorecrest and Dr. Vincent West for exclusive interviews with the sickest bands in metal and more. Head over to cultofphantasm.com. The only gravesite for all things horror and death metal. No filler, all killer. Now, please welcome our guest of honor. Uh, this is John McEntee. This is Chuck Sherwood from Incantation. You listen to the Phantasm Podcast. <laughs> to do the interview and then it I mean it monsooned and I was like fuck and I, it all the audio was just like thunder and lightning I was just like damn it and I'm sorry about that John yeah, but I, and, I, and I thought it was better anyway I was like if we're gonna redo it let's get you uh, you know talk about the songs too just to see if like, it makes sense you know so what he's called like a song by song rundown of the album you know okay. yeah absolutely I mean, where, Vince, where, where do you live I'm in Florida yeah. No rain then. <laughs> no, never. No bad weather. No hurricanes. No. <laughs> Your daily rain. No coronavirus. No, it's it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, but yeah, I appreciate you both taking the time to do this, and uh, yeah, let me uh, get my stuff pulled up here. I've, like I said, I've never used this app. This app's really cool. I usually use Skype for stuff sometimes, but. Let's see here. Give me just a second. Can you all still hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Give me one second. I'm just pulling my notes up here because I didn't know if I could do that. And Okay. And yeah, what I was going to do, uh, Chuck, like what I was doing with John, just go track by track through this record with you and we just talk a little bit about each song, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Of course. Excellent. Excellent. And are you a big horror fan too, like uh, John and me? Oh yeah, I'm. He's more I'm, than I am. Problems, man. Like I, I mean, horror is all I want. I'm a, I'm a poser compared to Chuck. With horror, so, yeah. <laughs> we can get into a little bit of that too, if you guys want. I would love to talk about that too as well. I love the new album, real you quick. Had your video on. Do what now? <laughs> That's a, you had your video on. I was going to show you my shirt. Oh, hold on one sec. Let me. Okay, is that, can you, is that, are we good now? I don't know. I can't see you, but. I can see you guys. Okay. Oh, yeah, Chuck's wearing a bad taste shirt. Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, that's a. I'm trying to see how to turn my. Like the weirdest movie ever, almost. Here, let me turn mine on. (laughs) Is mine on? I don't know if you can yeah, see. Got Dawn. Nice. <laughs> we had Ken Foray on a few years ago, and he's ended up becoming friends with my co-host and I. And he is the the nicest guy in the world, Ken Foray. And yeah. it's like, and I love, I love Dawn. I love Night Riders. Like those two movies are like my favorite things George ever did. And I love Night too. Day. I don't know why Day was just too long for me. I, I've grown to like it over the years, but man, Dawn I could watch every day. Like it's just. And I hated the remake. I, I thought the remake was awful. Crazies are is great. It's just a little long for me, um, but I like it. I did. I mean, I, the remake was I didn't like, but I love the. I like that one. Um, it's like season of the witch. Like I like that one too, but it's kind of what I want on blue. I want Martin on Blu-ray is what I want. Yeah, no, Martin is uh, timeless, man. I love that flick. I think that movie is outstanding, but um, but yeah. Let's see here. Let's see what we got here. Okay, we got this going. Let's see if I can... I'm trying to do this where I've got my notes pulled up, but I'm not turning me off. But I think that's what it's doing when I pull my notes up. Is Can you still see me or is it gone? You can 
see you. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we can see you. Okay, good. Okay, so I, I just want to make sure that I can look at my notes here so we can do the record thing. But but no, but uh, uh, anything John Carpenter up until like In the Mouth of Madness, I absolutely love as well. Um, Carpenter is a god, man. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've seen most of his movies more than I can count. Uh, do you have a favorite? Actually, uh, a favorite? Of John's, you know, yeah. Uh, the, too many. You know, uh, as you mean John Carpenter? Favorite? Yes, please. Oh, um, you know, the thing is really high on my list, but I would say equally, uh, you got your Big Trouble Little China. Man, that movie is so good. I, oh, great. It's the the soundtrack to that movie. I think is outstanding. Uh, uh, Prince of Darkness. Prince of Darkness uh, is awesome. Uh, even the cigarette burns that he did for uh, Masters of Horror. That was good. Um, I like Escape from New York. Oh, that's such a good movie. Um, let's see, John Carpenter. Look, crap. I mean, most of his career is. Oh, the Fog. What am I saying? Fog is like is like. One of my all-time favorites, man. I know this isn't Carpenter, but I know he was like weaving in and out of it. Are you a Halloween three fan like me? I am. Yeah. That I movie. Like, I like one, uh, and then after three, I don't. I don't care about the franchise anymore. Uh, after season of the witch, it's it doesn't matter. Right. Season of the witch, I thought was awesome. Sure. Yeah. Because I, it was going off of no plans. You know what I mean? To make it about the holiday, not about Michael Myers. Right, which which and they, I uh, love it. And Tom Atkins in it, man, he's so good. Oh, Tom Atkins is a god, man. Night of the Creeps. Uh, you know what's funny? My birthday was the other day, and we watched Monster Squad. I, I don't know if you like Monster Squad or not, but I have something really cool to tell you about it that I was not aware of as a Carpenter fan. You may already be aware of this. I was not. So Shane Black, we same director that did Night of the Creeps, uh... That, that did Monster Squad, but he had Shane Black, I guess, write Monster Squad. I guess it was his movie. But Shane Black, you know, he, he did like The Last Boy Scout, and he's an actor in The First Predator and, and everything. But what I thought was really cool was, apparently, he wrote a movie that John Carpenter was going to score and direct, where Kurt Russell and a group of Viet, Vietnam soldiers are like super soldiers, and they all end up like... I'm not sure if the experiment fails or what happens, and they all come back as zombies, and John was supposed to direct it, and it was supposed to come out in 1990. That sounds like uh, Invasion of the uh, Flesh Hunters with uh, John Saxon. It does. Do you remember that? Yeah, and, and maybe he was homage in that. I'm not sure, but that movie sounded amazing. Because anything with Kurt and John, to me, is just gold. You know. Perfect, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting, because I was really excited if they had actually made that movie. I thought that would be really cool. Um, but no, and there's still a, uh, there's a Toby Hooper that actually uh, flick that uh, slipped under the radar that's very similar to that too. It's like a unit that becomes like cannibals or zombies, really? or something like that. Yeah, I know. And there's another one about an alligator that I never. Oh, not not eaten alive, but there's another one that's like really some kind of crop. That sounds awesome too. Well, you know something I, I did. Eaten alive. It was fine. That was good. <laughs> Which one? I just seen Eaten Alive recently uh, for the first time. I've never seen it before. So good. Yeah. That's, great. That's a good movie. I thought it was funny. I thought it was a good one. Hell yeah. Marilyn Burns, too. It has that, it has oh, that yeah. Texas Chainsaw vibe to it, you know? You know, the... the yeah. I'm trying to yeah. think of the name of the... It was the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that... I think it was called Next Generation or whatever. Well, let me tell you something about that movie. So there's a Blu-ray out of that that came out a few years ago, and there's a different cut of the film. And the movie was originally called Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And the lady that worked with Toby on the original movie and the second movie directed that movie. And it was first thing Matthew McConaughey's in, obviously. And I believe even maybe Renee Zellweger. I know for sure McConaughey, even though it's accredited as Days to Confuse, but apparently he shot that first. But that movie, that director's cut of that, that return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre cut of that movie, is super gory. I know that I know that movie is probably a throwaway movie to you. I swear you should revisit that movie, that Blu-ray that I got of that 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 other cut of that film, which was like because that movie was supposed to come out in like '93 and they shelved it for like four years. Yep. 
I never knew that. Yeah. It's just kind of weird. I don't know. It was like a uh, trick or treat. What was the what was that movie called? Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What? Well, it's, it's next generation. Like, it's, that's what it's. That's what it's. Yeah, it's gonna. When you look it up on like Amazon or something, the Blu-ray, it's gonna say Texas Chainsaw Massacre: Next Generation. But that Blu-ray has the actual original cut of it, and it was called Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it's a different cut of the film. <laughs> I mean, they're both kind of wonky in it. And it's weird, too, because him and uh, Gunnar Hansen are the only two leather faces that are actually deceased. Yeah. They're like drag queen, like, like leather face. I don't know. I, I revisit it. Like, I never liked that movie, and I actually revisit it. I actually really enjoyed that other cut of it. And Scream Factory also did the same thing with Exorcist 3. There's a, there's a different cut of the third film that you can get on that Blu-ray that's about 30 minutes shorter and a completely different ending and beginning. And there's more of, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, 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 the guy that voices Chucky. There's more footage of him in the film. Um, I don't know why I can't think of his name right now. Um, Brad Dorif. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I always think Blue Velvet when I think of him. But, but yeah, but... The the movie's completely different. There's more like conversations between like George C. Scott and him through the entire film as opposed to it keep cutting back and forth and everything. So it's just another thing I just tell you to check out. I, I don't know. I'm a, I could talk about this his, stuff all day. His dialogue is fucked in that movie. I, I love Exorcist Three. One one and three are the best of that franchise too. I yeah, I think that was. I loved revisiting that movie, Exorcist Three. I didn't realize how good that was until I watched it. And the dialogue is just great. I remember seeing that at the theater. I'd cut school, and it's that's the scene with the the. I guess it's like a nurse or ghost with those shears. That still terrifies me when I watch it. Sure, and it's like they only explain all the murders how she got like gutted and stuffed full of rosary beads, but you don't see it. But you just hear that, and you're like, yeah, "That's cool." <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's it's. Um, well, I'm trying to think of another thing that I was watching recently. Um, that I thought was interesting. Uh, oh, uh, are you a, are either of you a Friday Thirteenth fan at all? Oh yeah. So Scream Factory is also same company's putting this Friday Thirteenth box set out, and there's an unrated cut of Part Four in it. I never knew that existed. I didn't either. And they went and got the director because it's the same cat that directed like Missing in Action or whatever, and like sure, just you know, yeah, did the Prowler. Dude, the Prowler is. Don't even get me started. That may be my. F oh, it's so good. Uh, dude, if, if, you, if I had time, I'd be able to show you my uh, my poster collection, uh -huh. which is nothing in comparison to uh, Kyle, our drummers. Uh huh. But Prowler, the most autographs I have on any poster is Dawn of the Dead. I have forty one on it. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, I actually just mailed out my Prowler uh, Locandina so that um, I could get Joe Zito's autograph on it because I have... Uh, awesome. What is her name? Uh, Chrissy Dawson? Yes. And I also have uh, Tom Savini on there, so I'll have the three of them. Are you a Maniac yeah, fan like, as well? One of my favorite flicks of all times, man. Do you like Maniac as well? Love it. Do, would they uh, show... I, I'm not on the remake, but the original, uh, the Joe Spinell version. Oh, is, they showed it in a theater down here when they put that before it came out on like Blu ray and 4K and stuff, and they showed it down here in a theater. I got to go watch it in the theater. Oh, uh, it was nuts. Nice. Yeah, it was really cool. Sure. But, but, um, yeah, Prowler, I think Prowler, anything like that, any, I guess what most people would call like a Friday knockoff, I love all that shit. All of it. Any kind of like. Somebody creeping around, hacking people up. Blood Rage, do you like that? Sure. Do you like uh, Bloody Moon? I have never seen Bloody Moon. Yes, Franco. It's it's one of his best. Really? I'm gonna have to get. I'm gonna have to watch that. I've never seen yeah, that. Yeah, and the body count's huge in it too, man. It's like it's like almost Giallo esque, but like the kills are just way too brutal. To be really? Yeah, like a little awesome. kid running across the street. Comes in the car and runs him over. He's <laughs> you guys, but I do need to get this interview done. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. We, I apologize. I'm sorry. No yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. <laughs> I shouldn't have got me going there with Chuck. Chuck, I'm sorry. I talked your head off. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me get. We'll get this rolling here. I am so sorry. 
So here we go. I will get rolling right now. How's that? Okay, sorry about that. No, John, no, no, I'm no. sorry. No, you're kind enough to do this, and I've got blabber yeah. diarrhea mouth about horror. I'm sorry. So yeah, <laughs> this is Dr. Vincent West, medical doctor. I am here today with one of my favorite bands, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Chuck and John from Incantation, and we're going to be talking everything sect of vile divinities that comes out August 21st through Relapse Records. How are you guys doing? Great. Hell yeah. Chuck, thank you for doing this as well. I appreciate it. Of course. And I tried to do this earlier with John, and I messed it up because I was sitting in a rainstorm, so we're going to try this again. And we're going to jump right in here. Uh, Chuck, if you could talk a little about the lyrics on each track. And then, John, if you talk about the music. And we kind of just kind of do a comparison fun thing here. And we'll jump right in with track one, Ritual Impurity, uh, parentheses, seven of the key is one. Sky is one. Sky is one. And Chuck could probably uh, remind me for sure, but I think we had this one during the Profane Nexus um, time. It's one of the 20 that we had for Profane Nexus that we just never really finished. You know, there was we had so many songs for that album that it was just kind of like, you know, we had to pick what songs you wanted to record and what songs you wanted to kind of finish and leave the other ones for later. Just so everything had the proper amount of care put into it. And that, uh, we kind of revisited that one, and it just, I like it because it's just kind of a, a it's fairly simple rager. It's a good way to kind of start off the album, just a no-frills kind of aggressive death metal song. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's a song's not brain surgery, but a death metal's not supposed to be brain surgery, so I think it's, um, you know, it's a perfect way to start a, um, you know, a, a good uh, death metal album, and it's a, you know, it's a it's just a kick-ass song. It just kind of kicks you in the butt, and then see you later. It's not like too long or anything. Uh, really happy with it, and um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, musically. I think. I mean, I think most of the music, the riffs, the original riff styles, I think were were mine. Did you contribute to this one? I can't remember. Shop. No, uh, th that was primarily uh, actually the whole song is your own. Uh, and I remember that there was like two riffs that we and oh, no I'm sorry just the one actually that we overhauled and cut out and yeah. it's the that's like the third one in that's kind of like that uh, yeah it was something was yeah, that was funky with that we had to we had to cut that out but um, yeah but I, I mean the, the thing is too to make it clear with all the songs it, it's all really a whole band effort you know regardless of who writes what the whole band really makes the song great. It's everyone's contribution. It's not like a, it's not like a, these are mine and, and his song kind of thing. It just, um, you know, so, someone comes up with the basic idea and we kind of go off it, you know? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and Chuck, and, uh, Chuck anything you wanted to add to that lyrically on that one? Yeah, um, it's, an, it's an Euclidean uh, uh, incantation against uh, Lamashtu. It's, um, it was a, um, a prescribed way in order to like uh, prevent like uh, child sickness, fevers, things of that nature. And uh, it was that you would take like uh, bread and sacrifice offerings, and then you would uh, cut open a pig and take its heart out, and you put it into a statue that resembles Lamashtu. And you put it over top of like a feverish kid or something for a few days, and then buried it out back. And then... Um, it was it was just really super bizarre because you had to also tie this uh, this idol with a heart in its mouth around a black dog. Oh wow! Around the house, I didn't make this stuff up. This is this is what you sound like. like you're crazy, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, supposedly uh, Lamashtu itself uh, had seven different forms, and being uh, the daughter of Anu, the sky uh, sky goddess. And uh, those seven names uh, were like um, caretaker, taken by Armina, uh, the one who causes inflammation, 
the fifth of the goddess, the face who is horrible. Like, it's like all this, like, just ridiculousness. And uh, it was a sign of, a, you know, sign of the times for them. They didn't know how to react to fever. So sure. it's probably Lamash too. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> wild. Kind of a little over, over, overboard with dealing with the fevers. Yes. <laughs> cool. That's wild. And then track two, John, I'm going to let you say, I, I tried to pronounce this earlier and I still can't pronounce it. Oh, I just it. I yeah. figured that one out finally. Yeah, I'm proud of knowing how to pronounce that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's, um, that's a, a song. I mean, that's a song, I guess we, if I remember correctly, we wrote, um, you know, for this time. I don't think that, I don't know if this is one of the ones that were not profane too. Um, that was through that writing process. No, this was well, later. Later, but we did. Um, I, I remember um, we recorded. We recorded actually with a different uh, intro riff to it, and then we basically decided uh, that the intro riff that we had original one just what we weren't feeling the vibe because we recorded the drums for the album two years before we finished the album oh wow so we get, went back to it we're just like this riff just doesn't sound right you know so right. we had to kind of rewrite the song a little bit but it ended up coming together really well it had a great vibe to it, it has a lot of um, you know it, it kind of goes it kind of goes like from the, the kind of doomy beginning to like uh, a kind of chugging middle area to kind of like a, a semi abstractish kind of ending. I just thought it was a kind of a cool, like, song that's kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, like a, uh, not a really interlude, but just like it just starts one place and ends someplace else, which is kind of a perfect transition for an album song, which is something that we don't really do that much, so I thought it was kind of a cool that it could work out and still sound coherent as a song structure because usually you do something like that and you're like where the hell did i end up and how did i get there but this one like the journey just makes sense somehow you know right right at least that's the vibe i get from it indeed like uh, i remember that the original portion of the intro was only about like maybe like a four count kind of flip-flop yeah and we stretched it out and it turned into something completely different and uh, now it's like, you know, when I hear it, I'm used to hearing it this way. But at first it was like, hmm. you know, just as you said, like, wow, stark contrast. You know? right. It was weird. Um, and I thought it was I thought it was really good that we used that as the lyric video. That's two minutes into the song until the lyrics start. <laughs> so it's kind of like, here's our lyric video. Now there's no lyrics <laughs> for the first <laughs> minute. I mean, even some people brought that up, you know, like. There's no lyrics for the first two minutes. Like, yeah, I know. That's us being assholes, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just our lyric video. The song doesn't have any lyrics to it, you know? I mean, it did. But it just it took a while to get there, you know? <laughs> and then what about um, lyrics? Uh, so, uh, Propitiation was uh, about, like, old uh, Carthage and uh, Canaanites and uh, just old Semitic tribes of uh, the ancient world. They used to uh, worship the sun. And they had these uh, four pillared um, idol like shrines they called Tophets. And uh, their main deity was Moloch. And uh, they would go into the Valley of Gehenna. It's mentioned in like some Old Testament stuff and everything too, where they right. would sacrifice kids to this big bull god that had uh, fires inside of it. And they would throw the babies in there and then preserve the remains inside of like clay jars with little stone monuments over it. And if you go to any portion of the old Carthaginian Empire, whether it be like Morocco, Tunisia, or whatever, um, they still have a lot of these uh, Tophet memorials for tens of thousands of kids that they sacrificed. It's super brutal stuff. Wow. Yeah. yeah it really sucked. What was that there? I lost you guys. I just said it really would suck being a kid back then. Get thrown into the to get sacrificed. <laughs> that's again. That's lyrically. That's wild. That's that's really neat. I, a great track too. Uh, and then we'll jump to track three. Uh, Entrails of the Hag Queen. Uh, yeah, musically that one was written kind of yeah right after we were well actually during the 
some space between the final tracking for um, Profane Nexus and the mixing because there was a there was an issue with some of the editing that happened on that album. Things got kind of screwed up a little bit. And we end up having extra like six month time until that album would get mixed. And that time, I, I wrote a couple songs. I just just was like a, I was inspired or whatever. Sure. And uh, that one was just, uh, I thought it was kind of cool thing. Uh, you know, I wanted to just start off kind of um, kind of aggressive a little bit. You know, with the uh, kind of weird. I don't know what they call it, tremolo, picking, punchy riff thing. Sure. Which, I don't know, I, whatever they call it out there in music land. <laughs> and then, um, you know, kind of have like a, you know, a, a kind of like a doomy-ish mid-tempo part. Like around that time was when I was really trying to focus more on some of the uh, uh, mid-tempos. I just wanted to revisit some of the older, um, say, profanation, iconoclysm, Catholicism, or even like the song like Blasphemy, which is like the cool mid-tempos and sure. uh, uh, kind of haunted rhythm stuff. So I kind of did that, um, you know, want to add that to the song. And then I just like the way it kind of ends because it kind of has a really, you know, it's another song in a way that kind of goes in uh, sections, you know. It starts off one way. It's like, yeah, wow, it's the same thing almost, but different, totally different. But it starts off kind of a little aggressive, goes to like a doomy-ish mid-tempo thing, and then goes to kind of like that twisting vibe kind of towards the end. Right. Which just seemed like it fit really good. It was like once we put the intro, the Hat Queen lyrics to it, it just fell together. It was like, it just fell right in the pocket it was really awesome i remember doing vocals for it the first time and i just you know came up this idea on the spot of like saying the first bunch of lines pretty quick or whatever and it just it just all fell together um and i think it really came out as a good song where the lyrics and the music really intertwined together great and i it wasn't you know we didn't really know i mean i just kind of Pick the lyrics for the song out of the air because it seemed like it kind of fit, uh, you know, like the lines or whatever fit in there. But then it ended up just flowing and being the right song for that, uh, you know, right lyrics for that song. Right. Well, musically, it, uh, it, it has such a, a unique approach to each uh, stage that you're mentioning, like the, the faster to the more mid pace, like the, the big gaps where you, then you got your chords that come in. It's like just a very unorthodox approach to where even uh, the one segment of uh, the drum fills is like a one count transitional thing into that slower twisting feel at the end. It's like uh, it's not it's not segmented. It's very smooth. Right. And that's something that I just loved about that that song the way it was written. And what about lyrically? Um, lyrically, yeah, uh, it's. Um, it's a legend uh, that was from the Erlanga era in the 10th century of Bali. And uh, apparently, this uh, witch who was widowed uh, had a daughter who was betrothed to a prince in that town. And uh, the prince essentially uh, didn't want to marry the daughter because, uh, well, her mother was a witch. And uh, the mother got really bent at the, the fact that this prince was backing out on the, uh, yeah. the marriage. So right. she went in. Down, she scooped up the kid and she took to the temple of death and she sacrificed it to uh, Rangda, who was uh, queen of the Layax in the underworld. And uh, she arrives and causes floods, famines, disease, whatever, and then unleashes a whole like uh, slew of these Layax, which are people by day, but by night their heads float out of their body with their guts and intestines and everything dangling. Oh, and wow. they, uh, uh, they seek out pregnant women to eat uh, the babies from the womb. God. And uh, <laughs> so the king was pretty bent out of shape about his son backing out on this, obviously, because everybody's getting ripped apart. And um, she uh, apparently gets married to the prince. Uh, the witch is cool with it and sends Ronda back to hell and happy, happy ever after. It's super bizarre, but uh, that's the way the story goes. <laughs> <laughs> that that one was wild. The the heads and the uh, entrails and they're eating. That's what. That's, <laughs> I can't even come up with anything for that's crazy. That's great. Uh, yeah, as soon as you're a horror fan, I can mention this only in passing that the uh, the movie Mystics in Bali from '81 okay. is a derivative of. 
Really? I will have to check that out. That sounds awesome. Well, that was... And I really like that song as well. Uh, that was one of the standout tracks when I listened to the album. I, I, I had no idea the anything behind it, but that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> that story, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> it's, but uh, track four, uh, Guardians uh, from the Prime Evil. Uh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. That was one. Um, I think um, that's primarily a song you wrote, Chuck. Right? Yes. Uh, that was actually a collection of, of of riffs at one point. Yes. And uh, I wasn't necessarily sure about uh, arrangement. And then uh, one day, John and I uh, were in his basement, and uh, we just started uh, mapping it all out and turned into what you hear uh, on the album. Actually, it never got altered again. Yeah, it was pretty much just yeah. There was. It, I remember he, he just sent me like a bunch of riffs that he had that were they were cool, but we didn't really have a structure for it. And we just said, "Screw it, let's just take time." And you know, these riffs are good. Let's right. just try to make sense out of it. And yeah, they just kind of you know we were able to flow them together pretty well. And just, you know, connect them, and it just um, I think most of the, yeah most of the structure stayed pretty authentic, right? I mean, we had a, a basic structure for a long time. I think all we did really was kind of just tighten it up, but not really, hardly any. I mean, uh, nothing that really uh, comes to mind that was altered. Like, I remember that uh, the, the intro portion I wrote as well, and that was separate from it at one point, and then returned to it, and now is the way you hear it on the album as well. Uh, yeah, the and, arpeggiated, like, uh, intro thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I really like all the different uh, uh, layering that you had created with it, and the effects and stuff. It really brings out uh, um, the atmosphere because it's it's like almost distracting. You know, you, you you hear that, and then it just goes right in. And I'm yeah, I think it's a good a good uh, rager kind of song. It was definitely um, yeah for me. It was. It ended up turning out to be one of the highlights of the record. Yeah, I like it. I, I like sometimes the short and sweet, just ass kickers, you know? Sure. That's cool. And what about lyrically? Oh, uh, so lyrically, uh, this is about um, a Hindu uh, demon uh, race that uh, guarded the primeval waters of creation. And uh-huh. uh, they, uh, they fed on human flesh, uh, but they also took animal forms. Um their true form uh, was so horrifying in their religion that they actually never drew any pictures of it. Wow. Um, it was believed that if you were to draw a picture, then you would be giving this thing uh, life. So they didn't want that. And uh, they only have it in uh, explanations where they said that uh, their animal forms were seen by humanity, but in their actual form in the primeval waters was that they were a bloated stomach with vertical eyes and long fingernails that drip venom. And that's what the, the song's about. Wow. <laughs> that's wild. Uh, again, lyrically, that's you're just knocking it out of the park. I can't get over Because John was mentioning you lyrically, and this is huge to talk to you about this as well, because it's very interesting to me. <laughs> Um, especially as a horror fan, it's like it's wide it's stuff I've never heard of either, so it's fantastic. Um, and let's see, track five, Black Fathom's Fire. Uh, yeah, that was, um, I think if I remember correctly, uh, the beginning part of that song was something you came up with, Chuck, right? That those riffs, yeah, uh, actually, all of the song except for the middle part. Uh, at the end, I'm sorry, not the middle part, but like near the end where you have like all the uh, uh, tremolo bar and everything. Yeah. We added that together, you and I. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Sonny's riff is actually at the end. Of that's the, the last one. That's the kind of, that kind of gives it the, a little bit of the Egyptian vibe. Yes. His, his riff. He, uh, but yeah, that was, um, yeah, I remember because we had that. Uh, that whole first part of the song, we just kind of need to figure out where to go with it, you know? And it, mm-hmm. Yeah, because originally I think I had it written all the way up into that gap, and there was another riff at the end, and uh, yeah, we just weren't happy with it. So it was a matter of, like, cutting that, and then how do you replace it? Do you speed it back up or keep it slow? And we decided to keep it slow, and it worked out uh, worked out well. Yeah, I, th- I, I think it really brought it, brought it to life 
adding that um, adding that you know, where we are and that kind of like because it gives it kind of like a it loosens up and, and kind of flows into and what last riff pretty cool actually it's kind of cool a cool transition of um, the, the two parts I saw and, and it, you know the end part came out really good too I mean I really like how we end up uh, layering the guitars to make it like extra heavy at the end and stuff definitely agree yeah I, I mean it's uh, it definitely has all of those qualities to, to carry over the story lyrically as well to where you know you can it's like a play by play I have a, yeah I mean honestly it's another highlight of the album was, I mean it's really for me it was really difficult because I think a lot of songs are good good catchy songs that could be good songs for you know like the release or whatever as a uh, you know some of the lyric video or singles or whatever you want to call sure. it that was definitely one that was um, a contender I thought cause I just thought it was really cool a really cool song really cool structure you know and what about the lyric so, I'm, uh, it'll have its time now yeah. <laughs> uh, lyrically yeah oh yeah so lyrically uh, I'm a big Lovecraft fan and, okay and uh, I had this idea of uh, something in a combination of uh, like the temple or maybe like a Innsmouth or something like that to where these uh, Cthulhu, uh, Cthulhu and the other uh, ancient ones are below the oceans. They're receiving uh, human sacrifices and animal sacrifices and stuff like that. And um, all of it ends up uh, becoming a sign to them uh, to infect madness into the minds of humanity and uh, usher their own extinction. Um, so it's like their, their gate you know, uh, their, their ability to, to return. And it's like these sacrifices had fallen deeper than anybody had expected them to right. fall. So they were like at the huddle depths where nothing is believed to exist. And uh, it just so happens that they stumbled upon something that, uh, well, <laughs> it's going to be the end. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. That's, that's wild. Yeah, that's, that's also fantastic. Uh, and again, musically fantastic as well. Lyrically, obviously, uh, again, out of the park. It's just, that's wild. Uh, and then uh, track six, and again, I'm probably butchering this with my southern accent, but Ingus Fatus? Uh, Ingus Ignis Fatuus. I totally messed that up. I tried. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it, trust me, it's not easy. I gotta learn how to say these for live, so sometimes <laughs> it takes me a little while to practice, too. But um, what's it? Uh, I mean that that those riffs, those were all Sonny's riffs. Uh, it was just a a, a little uh, kind of doom part that Sonny came up with, and we all just kind of added in our flavor to it. And I think it's a good, it's a great part. I mean the the riff, the the vibe of the riff, the way it kind of builds up. As a, it's kind of like an interlude kind of thing, right? I th I think it's great. I really, I think um, it, to me it shows uh, you know some of some of the uh, you know great songwriting that Sonny contributed to the album. You know, it's like there wasn't a huge amount of riffs that he contributed, say uh, you know like actual riffs, but the riffs he did have are, I think are really significant. I think this is a really great, uh, great little, little leeway, just, you know, like kind of a doomy interlude between, um, you know, two songs, you know, like the next song is kind of, kind of more of a rager. So it's kind of a good way to kind of, and, you know, almost like ending side one. I think it's probably the last one on side one, if I remember correctly. Right. Or is yeah. It yes. Yeah. And it kind of reminded me, and I could be wrong about this, but it kind of pulled me into this record because I really love Profane Nexus, and it feels like it kind of feels kind of like, and you all may think I'm crazy, but it, that song kind of took me back to the other record and then back into this record. Okay, well, that's good. I don't know why. Always but, want our records to into each other anyway. I mean, they're all like an answer to the last one. You know, you do a record, and it's just natural that we want to like, Accent either certain things that sure. know, we can expand more on, sure. or counter counteract it in some way, just normally, you know. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, I really like the way he, uh, he. Like, uh, 
there's there's no stopping. You know what I mean? Like one riff just flows right into the next as it goes. It's, right. Uh, it's really something unique. It's yeah. Uh, that also um, it, it also fits with the story as well, uh, which is um, Ignis Statuus is a uh, ghost light. Uh, from Celtic mythology, okay. uh, will o' wisps or fool's fire. Uh-huh. Uh, it's said that uh, the hand of Bree, uh, which was uh, a corpse of a hanged man, uh-huh. uh, with the wit made out of the victim's hair and their fat, is to uh, waxen into a candle, <laughs> and that was used as a way to, like, uh, I guess, put, put people in like a coma or something like that, or keep them asleep. Um, if you ever saw the movie Wicker Man, they use a hand of glory in that film. Absolutely. But it was also so. It was also believed that in at this time that if you were to use a hand of glory, um, it could lead you to treasure or to your death. Oh, and, uh, wow! But if you need to follow the uh, ignis fatuus, which were these you know small orbs of light or uh, with rolling fire, and um, you would follow them with your hand of glory and uh, it would lead you to treasure your death. Now, also, Ignis Fatuous were known to be in different colors and if you saw certain colors floating to people's homes, it could mean that it was like a stillborn child. It could mean that somebody was about to die in that house. It means that, uh, I don't know, your, your, your crops and livestock are going to die. Like, it was, it was a bad omen if you saw that happen. Um, Interesting. It also was known... Um, these ignis fatuous if you were to take a, a dagger and put it uh, handle first into the dirt the the rolling fire would go straight onto the blade because it was more or less somebody that uh, had died violently right and didn't want to exist anymore and now is looking for a way to not be this spectral light anymore so if you put that blade down there it kills itself interesting that's that's what that's about <laughs> that's that's wild um and then before i go to track seven not to get an interlude about this john but i've got to tell you guys this especially with chuck here i wanted to just share this with you i have a weird thing that i've done with the last record i i watch the dead zone the cronenberg movie with christopher walken and i turn the volume down and i, wa- I watch it listening to profane nexus <laughs> that's really cool, dude. That's awesome. I know that's we- that that movie terrifies me. And the first time I listened to Profane, I was like, you know what? Because I still buy CDs and stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna. I, I it was just uh, basically by accident. It was on one of my like pay channels, and I was like, you know, I still have cable too. I'm like living in the '80s or '90s or something. But anyway, but. I was watching it, and, and I had that album on, and I just left it down and watched the whole movie, and I just thought I would share that with both of you. That I, it, it, If you ever get a chance to do it, it would kind of fit. I don't know. It was weird, but... That's awesome. Yeah, it's just awesome. kind of a strange story there for you, but uh, back to the record. Uh, track 7, Chant of Formless Dread. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a song that we had for definitely around the profane time I don't remember if it was before that but that was mostly it it uh, was it was actually when uh, Alex was still in the band oh so was it around so it was around for dirges then yeah it was it was it was probably at the like right after Vanquish so that's oh so that's we're talking like 2013 or something like that. It's really not that long wow yeah I I was uh, presenting uh, like because that original yeah no I mean those riffs I was playing to Alex back then. Um, oh wow! We uh, we ended up timing the end of the song to both mine and your riffs, John. Oh okay. I don't even remember what that. riffs are mine or yours. <laughs> I mean, I remember yours. I think well, most of it was yours. I think. Yeah, there's only there's like two segments where we flip flop our riffs, but it's only at the end. Yeah, okay. That's a bit but, um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it was one of those songs that, that I, I knew we had for a while. I didn't realize we had it that long, but I knew we had it for a while. And it was, it was a song we liked, but we just, it, it needed the extra time and care. There's like certain songs that 
immediately just fall together and or fall together great. There's other ones that just you just get into a rut. You can't figure out what it actually needs, and you need to put it aside. And these, these, these sometimes it can, can be put aside for so long, it takes a while to really get into it and understand it again. And I think it was right that we waited, even though it's ridiculous that we waited since uh, like 2013 <laughs> to use the song. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, a, that's how many years that's like six seven years, seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> but the fact is, is that we we used it at the right time. We were able to focus on it because, really, for uh, for me at least, with this, um, you know, most of the songs of this album, we were we were able to take a lot of our older material that we didn't have enough time to kind of put together and use that, you know. Uh, use this time to really just focus on some of these ideas that we had that were good ideas but just needed that extra time that um, you know we didn't quite give it in, in the past and that was one of those songs that once we really kind of um, put it together but, I, but I, if I remember correctly actually I think we recorded most of that uh, song for Profane Nexus but we just didn't use it on Profane Nexus Wow! because if I remember correctly we had like a finished version of it and even we had your vocals I think on it and that stuff was all recorded for um, Profane Nexus I don't think we used it for it though I can't remember exactly or was that like the demo version My well, no like we had uh, yeah I mean, we, we essentially had everything done and then it just uh well, it just, it, we were writing. You know what I mean? Sure. It, it, you know. Well, when you write, when, it's one of those things when you do an, when you do an album, you know, especially when you, like, for Profane and, and Dirges, we had about 20 songs approximately for it. So it's just one of those things where you, you get stuck where what songs do we use, you know? Right. Like, we have to find out what songs work together well as a full unit. It's not about, like, the individual song itself because you don't want to just put a collage of songs on the album you want a, a, a whole story a whole vision on the album you know you want the, the album to mean something so you know sometimes we have we'd have these great songs but they just didn't fit in the context of the album that we were doing at the time and you know at a certain point you have all these great songs you're like well let's just you know, use this as our basis of making it a new album because the songs are good. Let's just build around that. And that's, I think, what we did more on this album was because we didn't have a lot of leftover. We had one, I think, one song that was a leftover. This time, yeah. usually have, you know... Uh, <laughs> you know, like, there are times so, where we got so much over. And it was, you know, uh, what was it, like, Muse? Yeah. You know, Muse was written and rewritten, and, and that was from uh, seven, eight years ago, you know? So... Oh. It's not that anything ever gets ignored. It's just that it gets put on the back burner while we're working on things that are much smoother of a, of a, of a writing process, you know? Because yeah, a lot of those older ideas, you know, they just need, you know, they need a new uh, perception on them or just needs a little bit of care and time and they can turn into some really great stuff. And it's actually better in a way because it brings... It brings like the older, an older feeling back into the song. You got like a little bit of new, a little bit of old, and that that older song that you might not use turns out to be something super cool because it's like almost like a multi generational song or something like that. You know, it's kind of weird, but um, I think it's a, a great song. And I was, I like the fact. I thought it was cool to have. I think it's our only real song that has backing vocals on any of our albums. So it was nice. really cool to have the, And I thought it was just great because. You know, um, Chuck used to play in Bloodstorm, so he did. He did some backings and vocals of Bloodstorm, right? Are you no, no, I never did. Uh, so this is essentially uh, the first uh, time I ever did anything like that. Really? Okay. Huh. Well, you did a good job. I thought you. I thought you uh, screamed before uh, on the album side. But anyway, the bottom line, you did a great job. It sounded awesome. It's killer. Gave, yeah. Gave a good, I like the haunting vibe of the the bigger. The you know bigger vocals you know multi vocal tracks something that we don't normally do but I thought it was kind of cool you know oh it's fantastic yeah, it, it has a, a, a certain like a, a contrast you know what I mean like uh, you yeah. know yours is more guttural and mine is more like um, just like a higher end and between the blended it really uh, allowed the music to just uh, 
uh, be more enveloping. Do you know what I mean? At least I felt as, as such. I'm, I'm yeah. glad that it turned out the way it did. It's cool. Absolutely. What about what about lyrically on that one? Oh, um, it's a uh, like it runs off of the style idea of like a uh, Egyptian execration, uh, which is like these like maybe three four line uh, Egyptian curses. Uh, sometimes I, I believe that they were even put into the mummy wrappings or something along those lines. Uh, but it's also uh, the idea of uh, incantation in general. So you know you're chanting a formless dread. You know it's. Uh, you're bringing it into being. You know, it's, uh, what is it, uh, the, the subconscious made reality? Like, like that kind of sure. feel, you know? Excellent. It's uh, as straightforward as it could possibly be. Okay. And a throwback to the band's name, in a way, so. Let's see here. Yes. Uh-huh. Let's see, so track eight, Shadow Blade Masters of Tempest and Maelstrom. kind of I guess one of the newer ones that I wrote for that this was also written kind of around the time of the entrails music okay. um, yeah I, I mean I don't know I, I, I think it's just a good a good um, I don't know a good mid-tempo kind of incantation song I mean, it was kind of what I was saying before that I was really trying to capture more is some of the just really good, uh, well thought out, um, you know, mid tempos to get that dark feeling. And I, I just like the, um, I, I, I like the way the guitars kind of contrast each other on some of the riffs. And sure. just the, you know, it, to me, it has just a really earthy old school type vibe to a lot of the riffs to it. Just, it's just, you know, to me, it's just, I don't know, it might sound cheesy, but it's down and dirty, like early 90s death metal, just like, grr, grr, Oh, yeah. You know, it's kind of, you know, whatever to it. I think it's it's really cool that it has, like, kind of the, the beginning, that, I mean, the ending that kind of is more, um, you know, more an attack and aggressive ending to it. I think sure. It's just a, a, a good, well-rounded uh, song. And I just, I like the, I just like, I think it was written, it's a song I'm, I'm proud of writing because I think it really was made to fit the uh, vocal patterns that were on it really well, which as a songwriter, and, and since I've been doing vocals, I want to try to learn how to, um, you know, use the vocals and the riffing as accents to each other, you know, it's part of just a personal thing that I try sure. to do with it, not just a hundred percent, just write, like I write, sometimes I write the riff and be thinking, oh, it'd be cool to have a pattern over it like this, you know, think about writing it that way, instead of just, just thinking about just the music, I'm trying to think of like a little more of a, not a complete project, but just the more, you know, thinking how the vocals might lay on it, so it's kind of cool. Excellent, excellent. It's not groundbreaking. It's not, I mean, it's not like the most amazing thing in the world, you know, but it definitely, for me, it was, uh, I had a little goal and I was able to accomplish it, I felt, you know? I I think that one's really good. It's really heavy. And then what about lyrically on that one? Um, It's, uh, I'm touching upon like the Japanese Taoist mythology. Okay. It's a... It's a collection of different um, stories that I read. Uh, one was like two primary gods that give birth to an armless, legless, boneless uh, creation um, caused by a ritual mistake. Okay. In this celestial temple, they called it uh, the Leech. And um, there's also uh, like demons that harbor wind and satchels uh, to lead mariners to their deaths. That was like the whole, you know, Tempest and Maelstrom. Um, there's also an eight-headed uh, sea, de- uh, sea deity or serpent, uh, Yamata no Orochi. Okay. I'm probably pronouncing that. Sorry. And uh, uh, in your Japanese? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I brush up on that. <laughs> so, uh, this uh, eight-headed uh, serpent, and uh, it was uh, the possibility of its survival from a, a Japanese hero figure that ended up beheading it. Uh, while drinking sake, I believe. There was like a raft that they put into the ocean of all these sake cups, and it, all eight heads came out and drank the sake at the same time, and he just kind of like chopped all their heads off. Um, 
And then there was a, a god's wife uh, by eating from the Nightlands, which was like um, the afterlife, I guess. Okay. Uh, she ate fruit in the, uh, the Nightlands, and it turned her from beauty into a decomposing hag. And uh, it was, um, she was chasing her husband out because she wanted to return to the natural world. But uh, since she lingered there too long, uh, she created the first uh, death, essentially, that she was never allowed to return. Wow. So all of those are within that, uh, within that song. It's fantastic. <laughs> it really is. That's... <laughs> I love it. Simple little, simple little concept, you know? It is. <laughs> and you can even see a, a concept of the dragon actually on the cover as well. Oh. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And then uh, track nine, Scribes of the Stygian. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's the slow one, right? That's the uh, new one. That's, yeah, that's another older one we had for a while. It was... Uh, what what I really like it just felt like for we had it for uh, profane I know that okay but we, we didn't put it on there because it just felt like uh, we didn't need another slower song on profane we uh-huh. had, um, what was that what, what was that one on there the um, incorporal uh, despair oh, and, yes and um, um, ancients arise. And it just seemed like we, it seemed like those two just really worked well together on that one, and this one just didn't really need to be on there. Just thought it would have just taken away because you know we love to have a, a mixture of stuff on the album, but we also don't want to over dominate it too much with uh, any one thing necessarily. Because sure, it just uh, unless it, unless it has purpose, you know, that it's not worth doing. But anyway, this one I think is a really great song because. It's just, it just reminds me of like a eerie horror movie from like the seventies, like you know something you would have uh, heard in Evil Dead or uh, yeah, like you know I don't know something like a cha- Chainsaw Massacre, just some kind of thing where it just like when everything's totally fucked and you just hear this, <laughs> you know, and it just it gives, it gives you that um, you know vibe like something really twisted and something's happening but it, 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 it's like it stays slow so it's like this there's some kind of like dark twisted piss off feeling but it's never really like expressing itself with the music it's just like it's here and I'm pissed and I'm just fucked and it's like just moves you know <laughs> and, but you know it's gonna it's gonna come out you know it's gonna come out somehow and it's gonna be really bad but it just you just really can't you know it, right now it's just kind of simmering inside or something so I kind of like that simmering vibe that, that has to it um, and it, I know as for myself I purposely kept it in a way where it just felt it, towards the end it just like it, it keeps structure but it also just doesn't fall into it too much like it has, part of it's a pattern and a part of it just throws away and it makes you feel like okay something was supposed to happen but it doesn't happen but that's because things are fucked you right know? right and it's supposed to be fucked and that's that's the vibe of the whole thing so mu- musically you know for for a little simple doom part to me sometimes those little things just mean a lot because and it also just has a good contrast because you know you're going from you know more heavier, sicker music, and this is giving, kind of giving things time to kind of like boil, boil again to the top or something like sure. that. You know, that's my way of looking at it. Yeah, I, I actually agree with all of that. <laughs> oh yeah, it booms, menacing, you know, and uh, it just keeps on going like that, you know. And, uh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, I think there's some. Do you think there's some evil something really fucked up happening in a horror movie and you're just you're just this is the time when you know the whatever the being or the creature or whatever is more just like thinking about doing something or about or something just happened and it's really brutal and gory and pissed off and it's like the aftermath of just 
realizing that like everything is now fucked, <laughs> fucked. And that's, you know, well, this is uh, lyrically. It's uh, it also fits, but in a different sense. Okay. So, uh, it was a dream that I had actually. Oh. And, um, so uh, I was walking upon these uh, paths of ice, and as they cracked, it uh, it revealed like extreme like uh, depths, uh, like um, if you've ever seen like uh, like. I don't know, like an Elm Street 2 when the bus, all the rock yeah. underneath of it just kind of f- away and it's just like plummets to unknown depths or whatever. A- absolutely. Like that, but- and I came up to a ledge and on the left uh, the on the on left sat these uh, two black cloaked uh, men in front of um, uh, like uh, partitions of ice with uh, hoods and uh, they're scribing into large books with quills and if I looked into the book, I could see all the details of my life unfolding in these books. Oh, wow. And um, they lifted up uh, a hand, the kind of you know, like a corpse hand, and it pointed to a field uh, covered in snow with a, uh, a tree line. Okay. And a mist started coming out of the tree line, and I walked into it. I started to actually like uh, demecularize uh, the like de exist you know i was bring, being broken down at a like molecular uh, level atom by atom yeah molecularly yes wow yeah. that's why <laughs> that's these, an, these are, there's not a lot to talk about with these songs that you can hear <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant it really is like all the way through i, I can't wait to finish this because it's every, every every song it's it's very extreme and they were uh, completely unpredictable. Um, so, track ten, "Unborn Ambrosia." Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one. Uh, that's one we had for quite a while too. I don't remember. I don't remember if it was a Dirge's era song, but I know it definitely was Profane. Do you remember, Chuck? Um, that was probably Profane, uh, but it had a completely different structure at that time. Yeah. Well, what, if I if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, um, but I think we were, we had so many versions of that song, so it might have even been a little older. But I remember we just it like it just kept building, and I it kept going nowhere. Like it just like we just couldn't find where where it needed to go as a song sure and it's funny because uh, that that initial uh, well not the not the first riff because that didn't exist until the very like last editing phase but it was the uh, uh, the main riff was how it started but it was maybe like two to three more minutes more oh wow than what it ended up because we knew we wanted that but what to do and the building started kept on going until it turned into a, it was a really long song. Yeah, I think there's a, I think we probably have a, a rehearsal version of like an eight or nine minute, ten minute version of that song. And it, it was just weird because we, it was one of those songs where you, we had the idea for a while. But like, like, uh, what's it, the Chance of the Formless Dread. Right. It was like we had the idea, we had parts of the song, or I mean, that, that other one we had more of a song done earlier, but this one, we had it for a while, we just couldn't quite place it, like it just, it just, sometimes it just doesn't fall together right, and it was driving me crazy, because I, I knew that the uh, the kind of uh, chromatic riff thing pattern was a cool idea, and could work good if it was done properly, sure. but it was so hard to fit that Five into a song and not make it sound like cheesy, and, and it just it just it just kept feeling out of context, and it was like either part of the song it, it would just sound like it got to there it was just too wimpy. It wasn't making that crushing feeling right. that it needed to, and it just after you know it just took everybody to really focus on it, and try to find a way to make it make it work. And, um, you know, just, that this one probably went through the most amount of uh, rewrites as a song. Like, even till 
the very end, like even you know, the first riff of the song was the last riff that we put in it. And it, we had something else. I don't remember what we had right before that version, but it was just, I just remember, you know, once that kind of fell together, it just, it just started to make sense. And the fall off riff where it kind of went and the bass kind of went, it just, it just, it started to make sense, but it took a long time. But certain songs, when, especially when you try to do stuff that isn't just uh, cookie cutter, like I wasn't trying to recreate an old song and do a new version. I was trying to, myself as far as writing, I was trying to create a different song, right. a totally different kind of song, but still an incantation sound. So sometimes you do that, it takes a while to really be able to incorporate it properly, but really fortunate we were able to do it. And honestly, like, um, most of the song was changed. Yeah, if you put the first version to the last version of the song, there's only, what, two riffs maybe that are the same. Everything else was different. But for some reason, it worked out. And it works out really cool. And when I listened to the final mixed version of it, I was like, it's a pretty cool song, you know? But right. I, that was the one on the album I was probably the most concerned about because I just like I, I really tried my best and everybody really worked hard in trying to make it the best it could be but I just wasn't 100% sure if it would have that right uh, punch to it and it ended up having it which is awesome it, it, it really came a long way yeah and the vocals the way the vocals lay on it is really cool too I think definitely um so this is actually a concept of my own. <clears throat> okay. And, um, it was uh, about uh, transdimensional creatures who have never really known existence. Okay. Desire for what they never had. And uh, they in turn feed on uh, fetuses and infants before they can actually be born. So they live in like a transdimensional state and uh, from, you know, and form demon gates from their dimension through the moments of conception to enforce their will. That's wild. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you know, that's actually lyric. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, I think it's one of the standout tracks on the album. I mean, I, as a listener, I could never tell that was something you all reworked, you know? So it's, I really like that track. Um, well, that's, that's how it goes sometimes though. You know, sometimes it's a, the, the tracks that you're not really sure about how it's going to be or, you know, you go a little bit on a ledge as far as trying to, you know, go a little bit outside the box on some stuff. Sure. And just try to find that right, um, that, you know, fine line of like doing something different, but also keeping something uh, in context properly. And, and that it kind of worked out. I, I'm pretty happy with it. I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to say favorites are or whatever because they're all special to me in a way but that's definitely a, a you know special track you know I'm, ha I'm proud of the work we did on it oh yeah and Great. lyrically it's it's wild chuck that's that's interesting i like that um and then uh let's see uh track 11 uh fury's manifesto uh yeah that that one was i just really wanted to have a little bit of throwback on the album for me. I mean, the throwback for me is like, you know, doing something like, you know, mid eighties, like a, something I not really something I would have did in Revenant, but just something that was, um, you know, more in that death thrash kind of vibe or whatever. I just thought it'd be kind of cool to, to have a little bit of a, that flavor onto it just for one song. Cause sure. I, haven't really written a um, you know a kind of a, a death thrashy head banger like that for quite some time right and I just you know sometimes you know with with how um, much much textures are on the album on so many songs it's like to have that song is just a simple breath of fresh air where it's just like the head back the song. <laughs> yeah. That's great because that's you know really when it all comes down to it, that's what death metal and metal and thrash and everything that's important. It really comes down to just you know hearing the snare pounding and just you know grinding out of some cool evil sounding riffs. You know, so it's like a it was kind of like a perfect little thing. You know, it's it's purposely 
meant to not like reinvent the wheel or anything. All it is just to say, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just fucking death metal. Let's just bang some fucking heads and, you know, thrash out and have a good time. And, you know, all posers must die. You know? <laughs> it's great. Yeah, that that's that one's a lot of fun. And then what about lyrically? Um, so this is uh, as simple as it gets to actually, uh, you, know, you know, to fit the music, to be honest. You know, it's something extremely straightforward, ext- extreme to the point. It's blasphemy. It's it's uh, it's the the idea of the three major religions of Christianity, Judaism, and, and uh, Muslim religions um, all suffer the fate of the very evils that they themselves created. Right. So yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty simple. Blasphemy. <laughs> but it's good. It, it fits with the song. It's a simple uh, concept for, uh, you know, kind of simple song for the most part. You know, it's perfect. I think it. I yeah. think they fit really well together because I love the song musically. I really do. I, I think it's great. It's just great forward, right through the throat. It's awesome. I love it. It and is. That's I it. think that you know, better, no better uh, story than to just you know get pissed and say how much you don't like stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, even though we've written, you know, uh, maybe a hundred songs about how much Christ and religion and everything like that sucks, it's still nice to have just a throwback simple one to say, you know, yeah, when it comes down to it, you know, we hate religion, you know? Sure, absolutely. Very cool. Uh, and then the final track, uh, Siege Hive. Uh, yeah, that one... Um, yeah, that's, I guess, one of the kind of newer ones that I, I wrote for this one. Um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it's a, um, I, I really like the track, too. I mean, it's a, um, you know, it's, I like the cool, just uh, ending riff kind of vibe on the album. It just, to me, it just is a good... It gives, gives me a good vibe with the early 90s when I listen to that song. It has that good kind of just, um, you know, it's kind of like that slowish mid-tempo middle riff that's really cool in there. Right. It just, I don't know. I, think, I don't really even know what to say about it. I just think it's, uh, it's a good... It's a good death metal song. It's, it's, I think it's a good way to end the album. It kind of has that... Um, you know, just that mid-tempo kind of double kick ending to it, where it just kind of you know falls into eternity, kind of thing. Sure. Just, uh, you know, overall, it's just a uh, a good song. Actually, um, yeah, it's tough to say. I, I guess a lot of songs are, and yeah, are pretty good. I guess that's why I put them on there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, a, gla- a great uh, closing track as well because it has a nice steady build up and then it just doesn't relent until the end. And the way that, uh, you know, the, the repeating pattern and the, just the chaos of everything that's happening at the end of that song and it just keeps on going and going and going. It's like to go, yeah, it's like the, the ashes that we just left here are still burning. Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, kind of vibe for sure. And then what about lyrically? So that's also another dream as well. Um, I had this dream of being in a uh, in, in a cylindrical kind of like a like a honeycomb almost, uh, or like a beehive, and uh, each one of these pockets was covered in a uh, thin membrane. If you've ever seen like Fire in the Sky, it kind of has that kind of feel. Absolutely. To it, except for it was it was actually like a, uh, <clears throat> a tower almost. And I'm floating in the dead center of it with a, uh, a ocean of tar that's actually slowly rising. And behind these membranes, you can see these batwing creatures fighting their way to try to get out. And as I speak, I'm not making any sounds, but they all uh, treat it as an acknowledgement to break out of their, you know, confines. Sure. And when you looked up through the tunnel, you could see the moon. And as they all flew out at the same time, they actually coated the moon uh, completely, uh, just blackened it out. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and that was essentially it. Yeah, Chuck has some really uh, bummer of dreams. I guess it's kind of <laughs> cool, but it must have sucked being him at, like, during the dream. <laughs> well, it's like, I get so used to them. Like, I used to be freaked out as a kid, of course. Because uh, if you can attribute your dream to, like, you know, a fever, sickness, drugs, uh, too much.
too you know bad food uh, you know or you just watch something like maybe watch fire in the sky that night and maybe that's why i dreamt it like i don't know but then there's other times where they're so just jammed up and they come out of nowhere that i don't necessarily know how to explain it but i guess i mean people try with books and things of that nature but i don't think they actually come to any like real conclusions uh, it's still the unknown, and it's one of the great ones to where you can actually use it as a great uh, source of inspiration for writing stuff. At least that's the way I treat it. Sure, sure. Uh, real quick, just to not to get off track of the record, I wanted to ask you guys some stuff about the album art just real quick, but I don't know if you've watched Fire in the Sky next time you get a chance to watch it on streaming or whatever. They've completely cut the end of that movie out of it. Uh, so that's the that's the best part of it. Do you rem- do you re- well, do you remember what? I, well, now I, let me be specific. What I'm talking about? It's the thing where Travis Walden's like, "This is me. This really happened to me." It's gone. Yeah, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Like when I the mean, when the movie ends, like he's like, "Hi, I am Travis Walden. This really happened to me." And because I remember seeing it in the theater, and my DVD has it, but when they show it on like streaming or cable or anything, it's gone. That's bizarre. I think it's really creepy because. At the theater, that terrified me when he's like, Hi, I'm Travis Walden, this really happened to me. And then it goes to the credits. It's like real quick, I can't remember exactly what he says, but it was like a whole other terror when I left that theater, and it's gone now. When you watch it streaming, it goes straight to credits. Sucks. Yeah, it's stupid, I don't understand that. Uh, Sorry, John, didn't mean to get in the horror thing again, but uh, what I was going to say, so the album art on the last album and the album art on the new album made me feel like when I first heard Incantation, like I wanted to ask you with the new album, and if you want to talk about Profane briefly too as well, but I love the album art on the last, the the new album and the last album. I think it's fantastic. Cool. Thanks. That's cool. Was there something specific? Is it the same artist? Is it a similar thought. Yes. Okay. Both were uh, created by uh, Ellering Cantor, and uh, he and I work in tandem to try to uh, take all the concepts that I was just mentioning about this whole album. Like each one of those songs being from all different parts of the world. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The idea that uh, the title of the album being "Sect of Vile Divinities" was is that they would all congregate in one specific area. Sure. And it was that uh, collective of uh, evil that had its own uh, understanding of their own natures and right. they became like a sect of these vile divinities and um, it's a uh, you know the half sunken temple and then you can still see like the attributes of like uh, entrails of the hag queens on the cover uh, the what is it shadow blade masters of tempest and maelstrom that's the the, the dragon right um, also the uh, unborn ambrosia that's all of the different spectral hands moving out of that like void oh wow you know, towards the earth you know and it's uh, all those attributes uh, are within and you can even see um, the uh, form of a uh, Moloch as well in like uh, in the like uh, I think it's like the left hand side you can see Moloch coming in between the, uh, the pillars as well so that's propitiation and um uh, for Profane Nexus, it was uh, the the rebirthing of a new god, essentially, through uh-huh. uh, Messiah Nostra, and also with songs like Rites of the Locust and uh, the uh, Horn of Gephren, and all three of those attributes are like very, very strong in the Profane Nexus, uh, because the, the death that was caused is now giving birth to this new deity, and it's being given life by these locusts that are draping the new flesh over this new messiah. Wow. And um, if you look into the, the left-hand corner, you can see all of the, uh, the different goats because in this uh, ancient society of uh, they were called the, uh, the, the Godothan. They were in England. Okay. And uh, they were wiped out by the Picts uh, centuries ago. And uh, the remains of their uh, burial mounds are still there on copper rods uh, that were for their uh, volor. They were like um, soothsayer women. Uh, They read bones and blessed you with these copper rods and everything, but the motif was always goats because the goats were so hugely predominant in those areas. And the translation from uh, 
uh, of Geffren just meant hill of goats. And uh, that's what the Godothan people's area was, this is the hill of goats. So if you look in that wow. corner, you can see the goats. Well, so. well you guys... The idea that they came back from, you know, from the centuries-old whatever burial mounds and they come back to destroy humanity. Yeah. <laughs> The both of that really, honestly, the last album and the new album just blew me away. I was like, I I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. I mean, the whole package. And then, Chuck, your attention to detail on the lyrics and John, your music. It's it's seriously, the last album. Not to you know bring up the past, but it's fa- unfucking believable. And the new album is unbelievable. I just can't get over it. Um, it's it's the whole package. Enjoy, you know. We, the, the thing I think that's important is that we just all put a lot of work into it, you know, at every aspect possible, we put work into it, and it works out well that, um, you know, Chuck is able to handle a lot of the lyrics, but he writes music too, and he puts a lot into it that way, but also just, you know, he pays a lot of attention to the lyrical content of the album, which is also very important, and, um, you know... Kyle and everybody else in the band too really everybody does pay a lot of attention to everything like even even things that come across as maybe crazy or chaotic or whatever still has a lot of thought and is done with proper feeling it's not just um, everything's off the cuff or whatever you know so and it's not like we're trying to be like super uh, you know whatever like oh, we're so cool because we put in all this thought or pretentious or anything. It's not about that. It's just We're just trying to create the you know music that's important to us and songs that are you know mean something. And we all just take the care that, that uh, writing music that's important to you should have in it, you know? And, you know, that's I think that's what um, is resonating with a lot of people hearing our, our material is that they can tell that, you know, this this is not just throw away. We're doing this just on a weekend for shits and giggles. You know, <laughs> we put a lot of time writing these songs in, in every aspect. You know, we like to jam them out as a band, like to feel it, like to get everybody's input on everything. And um, you know, it goes like I said from from everything, the artwork, the the lyric video, the all the video work that we've done on this album. You know, we. You know, it was difficult because of the quarantine, but we still tried our best to do as much as we could. You to did. To sure that everything <laughs> was just done in the proper way, because it is our, you know, we, we put a lot of work into the band, and we want to just present it in the, in the proper way. It's for us, and for people that enjoy our music, they deserve to have the best representation possible, you know? I think that there's a, a, a very, uh, like, balanced collaboration. It's with everything. You know, uh, Musically and otherwise, it's it's still a band. You know what I mean? Uh, this is not. A, I mean, I, I've been saying the joke recently of like, there's no I in incantation, wah wah. But the thing is, is that there really isn't. And like, you know, all of us, our our efforts are uh, are kind of endless. It's 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 really impressive to see that amount of time and devotion put into the things to where the actual end the product uh, is just as rewarding on, on our end as we find it humbling when people actually like it. So yeah, and I and I feel that we all we you know I mean especially Chuck myself and Kyle have been working together quite a while. We both know where we excel and. and and whatnot, so we're able to let each other just excel where they excel at, you know. And it's like it's just you know we don't have to guess or you know we know we know um, you know we just we just know each other's you know, way we work. We know um, how to take each other. We we're also not like wusses about everything, you know. We know how to take criticism if things aren't good. We're not. It's not like okay, I come up with this idea and everybody else hates it and then, you know, I get pissy about it or whatever. It's not, we don't work like that. We, you know, we all know that we, we all want the best for the band. We all work together as a team and we're, we got to take that criticism because, it, you know, if you can't be honest and criticize the stuff with each other without getting offended, you know, that, that's just the way you have to do it if you want to do anything that is, um, you know, truly properly vetted and to its best. Because nobody, nobody in the band, you know, on our own, we could do good, 
but together we could do stuff great if we all just push each other to the limits that we need to. Well, you have, and I'm telling you, the, not to interrupt you, that those last, the last two records, man, I feel like I'm in my teens. Like it's seriously, you've got this thing. The two of you, you've got this thing firing on all cylinders. I mean, the artwork, the music, the lyrics. I can't believe the the back. I can't thank you enough for sharing the backstory on those lyrics. But John, I mean, the whole thing is just it's outstanding. It really is. It's 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 incredible. Well, trust me, we when we play this music and write this music, you know, we feel like we're, you know, back in our teenage years too, because music brings you back to a time in your life where, you know, things were simple, where it's just about you know, trying to express yourself as a musician. And just, right. You know, life was easier and we enjoy, um, you know, enjoy that part of music. We enjoy what music brings to us in our, in our life and the importance that it sure. has in our lives, you know? It's, uh, it's something that I don't think that I have the capacity to be without. It's, it's that important. And uh, whether it be something as trivial to, to others as like the one riff that we might, you know, keep, get rid of, entire songs, albums, places you've been, people you met. Yeah. Every single experience of that, I don't want to not have that. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, Trust me, I, as a musician and um, playing in the band for so long, it's, it's just unbelievable the amount of great experience I've had because because of music and the great people we've met and just yeah the experiences and you know it's it's you can't even it's a little surreal <laughs> yeah it's crazy to think if you would have asked me you know as a, uh, you know teenager just coming up with this idea of the band. And look at looking at all the experience we had now. I wouldn't believe it. I, I would not believe that I'd still be doing it at this uh, stage. <laughs> and in fact, we're still putting out music that's relevant. I didn't know that was funny. I mean, in, in 1990, I, I would have never thought that um, I would have still been creating music 30 years later and and have it be so important to the death metal world. I thought five years max, you know, and, and everyone is going to hate us and. We're going to be has beens or something, you know? Not the, the case. You know, my <laughs> friends still mention it all the time to where it's like I listened to Incantation as a fan for years. And then, you know, you flash forward from what I'm, I heard Golgotha in 92, and right. then I met you in 98. But then in 10 years later, we're playing together. It's incredible. And it's it's just like you know high school friends of mine you know they're just like i still cannot get over the fact that you're in that band and i'm like Me, neither can i <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> I, 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 I got t-shirts of when i would just be sitting around listening to you on the jukebox you know what I, mean? right. I can't believe that you know i'm still doing the band now i never would have thought that at all i mean it's really I, for me, I, I, my my goal was, you know, if we put out a seven inch, I'll be happy, you know, back in the day. Or if, we, if we're lucky enough, we get to do one album, everybody hates it, and I go and I'm scared. You know? and I, and I was fine with that. I didn't expect this to happen. By you know, no means did I expect this to happen. But it's great. It's great that it did because you know, music is such an important part. Well, yeah, I'm still here. Are you guys still there? <laughs> To an understand and create great stuff with, you know? Right. It's a magic that they have. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've never been in a more uh, functional and creative situation, at least band wise, uh, ever. Well, you guys have outdone yourself with that new album. It's fantastic. Um, it's the last album is fantastic. Just since I've got you both here, just tell you both again, because John, when I interviewed you before, it was like before that one came out. So it's fantastic. The new album is just outstanding. Everything about it, the artwork, the lyrics, the music. You guys, seriously, and to take the time to do this with me today as a fan, I can't tell you enough. Our listeners are going to be thrilled. So, well, thank you. We're just we we, are, we appreciate the support. You know, it's really, it really means a lot to us that you know you you care enough about it to give us such a in-depth um you know um interview you know well definitely honored it's very cool thank you 
Guys, seriously, this has been the most outstanding interview I've done all year. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Like I said, I really appreciate the opportunity.
In case you haven't heard of some of these podcasts, from myself, Dr. Benson West, Master Roger. Get ready for godless seasons, baby.